Hello, my dear friend. Uh, I'm so happy to, to be with you, and I would like to thank you so much for the second webinar of Institut de la Main uh, in Paris. Uh, you know that Institut de la Main has been created a long time ago by uh, Raoul Tubiana, and uh, we were a pioneer in the, the creation of a group of uh, surgeons de dedicated to the hand uh, surgery, but not only the hand, uh, all the upper limb, because some surgeons uh, uh, work only for the shoulder, personally for the wrist, etc., etc. As you know, or maybe you don't know yet, but uh, I'm uh, retiring uh, in a few days. Uh, it's time for me to stop the surgery, but uh, you're not uh, going to get away with this because uh, I continue teaching and even do more than now. So you'll still uh, see me for a long time. So uh, today uh, we have a special uh, webinar about uh, the Kinbog disease, which is a very incredible uh, uh, pathology, you know. And uh, since uh, the description by Kinbog uh, more than 100 years ago, uh, it was a challenge to treat that. And uh, we'll have uh, to, uh, to see how we can uh, manage to uh, this uh, pathology. So I ask it to uh, Lorenzo Merini, who will be my representative, to uh, uh, take in charge the discussion and everything. Uh, so we can start. Thank you very much, my friend. All right, thank you, uh, Christophe, for this uh, nice introduction and for the kind words. Uh, Christophe is actually in uh, abroad um, and with uh, unfortunate limited uh, internet connection, so I will do the honors of introducing our uh, wonderful team today, and uh, we have the pleasure to have as guest speakers Greg Bain from Australia, uh, Simon McLean from uh, New Zealand, and uh, we'll have a topic with uh, Joe Yupli from Korea. And of course, we have also with us uh, Mathilde Gras and Alain Barnaut from our team uh, at the Institut de la Main in Paris. You are very uh, numerous in the audience today, uh, so thank you for your interest. Don't hesitate to ask your questions through the uh, questions dedicated button, which is right next to the chat, and we will do our best to answer them. We have two breaks for uh, questions within the next hour. And now, without further ado, let's get started with the first speaker, which is uh, Alam uh, Arnaut on the current bibliography on Keybox disease. And welcome to everyone for uh, this uh, first lecture. Uh, Christophe Metunard asked me to um, talk about uh, some current data we can uh, have from uh, the literature about Kimbock disease, and uh, we can uh, also uh, consider it as a, a short introduction. So we all know Kimbock disease was first described more than 100 years ago, and uh, since then many procedures have been described, and now the optimal treatment according to the stage remain uh, controversial. So if we uh, focus on the literature, we can find a huge number of publications. And uh, just in 2020, uh, Kimbock disease was uh, cited more than 100 times. And we can easily consider the past decade as the modern era. Uh, what do we know about the etiopathogeny? Uh, we used to consider uh, the Kienbach disease as multifactorial with mechanical factors, uh, mainly the negative ulnar uh, variants and uh, vascular factors. But uh, if we focus on the um, uh, recent literature, uh, uh, it's not that clear because uh, we have inconsistent data, especially for the negative ulnar uh, variants, which uh, some uh, study that uh, do not uh, uh, support the exact correlation. What is very it's interesting is that uh, those new biomechanical and vascular uh, patterns and uh, our colleague today, uh, uh, Simon McLean, is going to uh, will give a lecture about uh, this interesting topic. What about the diagnosis? Uh, we all know uh, the Lickman classification in four stages, uh, which is based on the radiographic and MRI uh, findings. And uh, in 2010, uh, two or more stages were added, the Lickman 0 and the Lickman 3C, making this classification much more uh, accurate. We have also the advanced imaging with the uh, gadolinium enhanced MRI with the Schmidt classifications, and uh, uh, it is uh, which is uh, used in a new uh, treatment algorithm, uh, new current treatment algorithm, and we'll see that later as well. 
And of course, we have the arthroscopy, which allows a dynamic cartilage lesion staging with the Bain and Beck classifications, uh, which introduced uh, a notion of functional articular surfaces. And uh, we'll have also a lecture about uh, this uh, later. For the therapeutic option, we use to indicate the unloading procedures and the nature vascularization in the early stages and the salvage procedures uh, in the stages up to 3A. But uh, we'll see that often this uh, uh, red boundary uh, is not that clear. And uh, it's uh, quite interesting to, uh, to see what are the current practice about Kimball disease. We have this uh, uh, recent interesting survey of uh, hand surgeons that show uh, that shows that the uh, radio shortening is the uh, most preferred uh, technique among hand surgeons. But what is most interesting uh, is uh, that 90% uh, uh, of the hand surgeons uh, consider the Lickman classification and the owner variants are the most important uh, uh, criteria uh, to uh, decide the treatment. And it's uh, uh, very interesting to see that in 1915, the majority of the surgeons do not uh, consider the arthroscopy of a key step for diagnosis and treatment. And maybe today uh, the results will be different. For the lunate uh, unloading, uh, the radio shortening osteotomy is considered one of the, uh, one of the gold standards uh, in the early stages, and uh, some studies showed good results for the advanced stages. But uh, there are concerns about uh, the DRUJ congruity and the instability of the DRUJ. We have uh, some uh, very uh, recent interesting works uh, about selective shortening, and especially uh, this works for, from uh, Emmanuel Camus and colleagues. And uh, I thought Emmanuel was in the assistant. So, uh, hi, Emmanuel, and thank you uh, for the picture. Uh, the, uh, this technique uh, shortens only the raises facing the lunate. So we have 11 cases uh, published in 2019. And what is very interesting is uh, the improvement of uh, the MRI file aspects on uh, the MRI aspects, and there is no worsening of lunate shape and no ever reason to collapse uh, at the seven years uh, follow-up. So it's very seducing and interesting uh, procedure. We have also the very distal wedge osteotomy, uh, which is uh, uh, with the wedge apex distal to the conventional uh, technique. It's also very seducing, but we have also uh, only uh, six patients with a very short follow-up of three years. For the capital shortening, uh, the main uh, concern is about the overloading of the ST joint, uh, and some studies show carpal collapse in all patients. And uh, the partial capitate shortening uh, appears as a ver an interesting uh, alternative solution. The principle is uh, not to disrupt the uh, scaphocapitate joint, and uh, it doesn't affect the mid-carpal and uh, scaphocapitate dynamics. We have a number of uh, uh, recent studies uh, that all shows uh, uh, excellent revascularization rate on the nate, but uh, uh, the series are very short and uh, very small, and the uh, follow-up uh, are uh, very short, so we can uh, conclude anything. For the radio score decompression, it's a very simple uh, procedure this good, which uh, gave good clinical outcomes, but we have inconsistent data about the disease progression. Uh, so we can't uh, conclude uh, anything uh, on this uh, meter. Uh, the open lunate core decompression is very simple. The 20 uh, cases published in 2011 with an improvement of the functional parameters. It's uh, not recommended in the stage 3B. And uh, what is very uh, interesting is the arthroscopic lunate core decompression, uh, which uh, uh, is a very uh, seducing technique, simple, and it is uh, described and recommended in the arthroscopic grade zero in number of recent papers by our colleagues uh, present today in the webinar. So we can conclude that the uh, selective uh, shortening uh, are very encouraging, and we have a kind of lack of data for core decompression. But uh, the lunate core decompression arthroscopy uh, is very uh, seducing. Is very seducing procedure. For the vascularized bone graft, we know that the pedicle vascularized bone graft are one of the first treatment options for the stages up to 3A with satisfactory results. And uh, uh, we can find that the 4 plus 5 extensor compartment artery uh, bone graft is the preferred technique among uh, hand surgeons uh, with this survey of the other survey of hand surgeons. And it is mainly used for its favorable properties, especially uh, the wide diameter of the pedicle.
And we have a recent uh, very interesting review that shows uh, a good uh, global reverse colorization rate, uh, but no technique has clearly showed its superiority. We can also uh, say a word about uh, the mixed technique, medical graft plus uh, leveling procedures, and especially this technique uh, described by Christophe Matoulin. And uh, Mathilde Gras will give a lecture about this later. And there is a growing interest around the free vascularized bone grafts uh, because uh, we can shape uh, those grafts in any configuration. Then we can use them uh, as osteochondral grafts in the advanced stages to reconstruct the uh, uh, lunate cartilage with a good consolidation rate. And uh, uh, the results were promising in scaphoid non union treatment. So, uh, very interesting. So uh, for uh, lunate salvage procedures, we feel that everything has been tried, lunate excision plus tendon interposition, pyrocarbon, silicon, titanium, atroplasty, but we can't conclude anything on uh, those procedures. We can say a word about vascularized PC form bone graft. So it's known as uh, uh, SAFARS procedures of 51 cases uh, published in 2010. And uh, we have a recent uh, long follow-up uh, uh, series uh, that uh, shows the main uh, concerns are about the carpal collapse and uh, the stability of the implanting bones. And we'll have uh, uh, a lecture about our colleagues uh, we, who uh, is going to uh, talk about the pro and con of this technique later. For lunate uh, uh, excision, single lunate excision, uh, it's uh, not that popular. It uh, used to be considered as an inadequate uh, treatment because of the progressive carpal collapse. We have a recent study uh, that uh, shows satisfactory uh, functional uh, outcome despite the carpal collapse. And a very recent biomechanical study uh, that, uh, show, that conclude, uh, concludes the atroscopic excision uh, could potentially prevent for kinematic changes. And uh, Lorenzo Mermini uh, will talk about this possible uh, technique of the future at the end of the webinar. So stay with us, please. For the salvage procedures, uh, the limited intercarpal fusion, uh, the STT and the scaphocapitate uh, fusion uh, showed a significant decrease of, uh, low on lunate, but uh, the main concern is about the high complication rates uh, with uh, this procedure, the evolution to arthritis. And we have some uh, recent studies, the STT, uh, about STT at scaphoid capitate fusions, but uh, uh, we can conclude anything uh, about uh, those uh, studies. What is very interesting uh, is uh, uh, the arthroscopic assisted procedure, the, uh, uh, especially the scaphocapitate, uh, radioscaphalunate fusions, and they are described and recommended in the recent papers, and uh, uh, our colleague are, uh, will give lectures about uh, this later. We have also some uh, aned anecdotic uh, papers, uh, 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 for example, the 3D printed lunate for a Kimbuck disease, uh, but uh, we, we have to wait for uh, definitive results. Uh, the treatment uh, algorithm uh, is uh, very in the trend. Uh, we have uh, the bench meet lickman uh, treatment algorithm, which is very uh, accurate and relevant. It is based uh, on the advanced imaging and the arthroscopy. And uh, we are very lucky, to, lucky today because Professor Bain uh, will uh, talk about this. It is a very interesting patient-based and surgeon-based uh, treatment algorithm. We have other treatment algorithms proposed uh, today, uh, but uh, they are not so different from the uh, first one. So if, uh, as a conclusion, you can say uh, that from the literature, there's n there is no real uh, evidence-based consensus about which procedure is the optimal uh, one in which uh, stage, uh, because uh, we have uh, a small series, most of them are level four. Uh, but what you can say is that the advanced imaging and the arthroscopy um, allows plausible diagnosis and treatment algorithms nowadays. And, uh, uh, the Kimbuck disease appears as uh, the primary, uh, uh, the, uh, the best example of Tillor treatment. Uh, thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Alan, for this very nice talk. Um, I think we're going to move on directly with the Simon McLean presentation about the risk and really in thanks, Kimbuck disease. For asking me to speak about some of the work we have been doing looking at some of the dynamic aspects of the pathology of the Keenbox wrist using 4D CT scanning. I would like to thank Greg Bain who has collaborated with me over the last five years on this work and provided many of the cases. 
And this is work we have subsequently published in the European Journal of Hand Surgery this year. So keen box disease remains an enigma for many, but what do we know about the disease? Well, David Lechman taught us that there are a series of changes to both the lunate and the wrist seen on plain X-ray as the disease progresses. MRI scan has allowed us to spot early disease, which isn't seen on plain film. And like the slack and snack wrists, we know that the lunate can fail, instability can develop, and the wrist can ultimately fail. We also know that there are changes that happen to the articular surface in the disease, and that these tend to follow a progressive pattern. Greg has shown us the value of arthroscopy in determining disease, and we scope all of our patients before deciding upon management. And what else have we seen? Will we find synovitis in all cases on arthroscopy? We also find tears to the scapha lunate and lunotriquetral ligaments, even in early stages of the disease. And we also see patients with instability symptoms and carpal malalignment. Therefore, as well as osseous and chondral change, changes to the soft tissues, either through stretching or rupture, must be an important component to both the pathogenesis of the disease as well as the development of symptoms. We have also seen failures after treatment, and we see cases of impingement or instability symptoms, or patients with weakened grip, or patients who present with persistent pain. So for our methodology, uh, we used a Toshiba Aquilian 1 multi-detector scanner, and we've looked at 20 patients with Keenbox disease who we've scanned. The data is processed into a dynamic 2D or 3D cine image and is reformatted and reorientated depending on both the joint we're looking at as well as the pathology in question. Our previously published risk protocol includes six sets of movements involving the radiocarpal, midcarpal and distal radial ulnar joints. So what have we found? Well, we've found not just coronal fractures, which have already been well described in Keenbox disease, but we've also found sagittal fracture lines in about half of our patients, as well as fractures at the site of interosseous ligament attachments in a number of these patients. We feel the sagittal fracture line is caused by impaction. And what we see on dynamic imaging is how the sagittal fracture line corresponds to the ulnar edge of the capitate, as well as the ulnar edge of the radius, where the lunate is pinched and point loaded between these two bones, with the capitate acting as a nutcracker. This fractured lunate then widens on ulnar deviation and this impaction fracture at the proximal subchondral bone plate of the lunate is formed from a template of the underlying distal radius. On dynamic sagittal images, we have identified that in the cases of a coronal fracture, the anterior horn of the lunate often remains static in wrist extension with the volar radiolunate ligaments attached. So with wrist flexion, the capitate translates anteriorly and tilts the volar horn of the lunate, and this creates mechanical impingement over the volar rim of the distal radius. We term this radiolunate impingement, and we've found it to be associated with advanced stages of the disease process. We have also identified three cases of impingement between the ulnar styloid and the triquetrum. This is a dynamic finding on ulnar deviation on the dynamic coronal images, and we have noted that these patients often have ulnar-sided wrist pain. We have also shown that proximal row instability can occur by two mechanisms, either through stretching and rupture, of the introsseous ligaments, leading to either a dissi or a visi type deformity, or secondary to a fracture of the lunate adjacent to these ligament attachments. 
So this brings into view the concept of dynamic internal lunate instability. So we believe that these lunate ligament attachment fractures are a poor prognostic sign leading to central column collapse and Keenbox disease advanced collapse. In cases of coronal fracture and fragmentation of the lunate fracture and fragmentation of the lunate the volar and dorsal horns of the lunate move independently due to the position of the capitate as well as the attachments of the scaphalunate and lunotriquetral ligaments. So this we term internal instability of the lunate. On reviewing the dynamic motion of the Keenbox wrist, we believe that ulnar translocation occurs quite commonly and can occur by two mechanisms leading to either a telesnic type 1 deformity where the entire carpus shifts ulnarly or a telesnic type 2 deformity which is associated with scaphalunate ligament rupture. So if we look at the first mechanism which is ligament attenuation or rupture we believe this mechanism is very similar to what is seen in rheumatoid arthritis and it's due to synovitis within the joint an attenuation and rupture of the important extrinsic stabilizing ligaments. So this leads to a telesnic type 2 deformity where the entire carpus translocates ulnarly. The second mechanism leads to a telesnic type 1 deformity where the scaphalunate ligament tears or avulses. The central column then collapses and the carpus shortens. The attachments, however, are maintained at the dorsal radiocarpal and intercarpal ligaments, but these develop pseudolaxity due to the carpus collapsing. And this leads to a telesnic type 1 deformity. So what do we already know? Well, we understand the osseous classification, the vascular classification of Schmidt, and the cartilage classification of Bain. And these three classifications have helped us understand a lot more about the pathology of Keenbox disease. But what do we now know? Well, we now know that the dynamic aspect of the disease is very important. And we also believe that a successful surgical outcome depends on the balance of the wrist or carpal equilibrium and that this is often dependent on the state of the soft tissues. So what does this mean? Dynamic imaging allows better understanding of the disease process, how the fractured lunate functions and how the Keenbox wrist functions and better understanding of this pathogenesis will help determine a successful surgical outcome and help us understand more about the natural history of the disease. Many thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Beautiful imaging, amazing uh, images and uh, analysis of the uh, of the wrist. Matilda, are you ready for your presentation? Uh, now we will move to Kingbox disease uh, treatment by lunate revascularization and shortening radius of So. Uh, here you can see a Kinbock disease with a, a collapse uh, of uh, the lunate <clears throat> and uh, you can see fragmentation. So it's a Lichman uh, 3B. Uh, Greg uh, was supposed to give his talk uh, before so, uh, and he will give us uh, uh, his idea of uh, which, uh, which, his, uh, which is this, uh, the stage in uh, his classification. Uh, but you can see here that uh, even if we have a big collapse and uh, fragmentation, the cartilage is, is uh, still uh, uh, good. So uh, in 1993, Bushler uh, was invited by the French, uh, French Society uh, to give a, a teaching talk uh, about the Kinbock disease, and he made a very uh, wonderful uh, review of the literature. Uh, about uh, the Kinbock disease, and uh, at, his, at the end of his talk, he, he said, uh, I have a dream, radius uh, shortening plus uh, uh, lunate revascularization. 
So Christophe uh, Matula uh, uh, was uh, thinking about it and uh, he found some uh, uh, some anatomical study and the first one was from uh, Robert Judet in 1964 and uh, he, he published this uh, drawing you can see here uh, who was uh, talking about uh, a graft uh, with a pedicle, pedicle from uh, just behind the, the, the pronator prolatus. And uh, Menck did almost the same uh, uh, discovery in the 1960s, almost in the same time. And then it was a little bit later uh, that uh, Brown, Kuhlman and KY in different parts of the world who described the uh, uh, the graft. And then Max Arleu and Christophe Matoulin uh, t took all those uh, study and uh, uh, did some other cadaver study on 1965. And they discovered describe uh, this uh, artery you can see here and between the radial artery and the ulnar artery and uh, so you have uh, the volar carpal artery arise from the radial artery here and runs along the volar aspect of the radius and uh, you can see that uh, uh, it's branched on the, the palmar side of uh, dorsal uh, distal radial joint uh, forming uh, an estomosis with branches of anterior artery and branches from uh, of uh, the ulnar artery so you can see here the the artery from the radial side to the ulnar side like a T shape and uh, with the anterior artery here and uh, uh, the joining through the, the two uh, arteries. The radial branch of the volar carpal artery is always predominant. So that's why it makes sense to uh, take, uh, and there's many branches uh, vascularize, uh, whom vascularize the medial part of the distal radial uh, uh, epiphysis. So it makes sense to keep uh, the, the radial uh, pedicle and to take the, the graft on the medial uh, side of the radius. So they uh, published the, the graft and the technique of the graft. Uh, initially, it was for scaphoid non but uh, it's the same for uh, lunate uh, uh, raw vascularization. The, the patient is under local regional anesthesia with a tourniquet. It's an uh, outpatient surgery, and uh, we do the classical Palmer approach of uh, Henri. And uh, the, the approach is uh, uh, continued distally uh, in the carpal tunnel in order to have a good uh, view. Then we first uh, spotting the flexor capillary radialis and the radial artery, you can see here, and uh, here in, in, the, in the picture. And then we flex uh, the wrist in order to release the tension of the flexor capillary radialis and the flexor pollicis longus. And uh, uh, then uh, the volar carpal artery is always in front of the superficial uh, aponeurosis of the pronator prolatus and above the volar distal radius parasum. So you can see here, we open uh, the aponeurosis and uh, then it allows to arrive uh, just uh, uh, on the right artery, which is above. Then we make a temporary fix fixation with a car wire uh, to retract the pronator prolatus and uh, we make a dissection of the lateral half of the pedicle superior. So we keep here the, uh, the branches from the radial artery uh, in order to save it, and uh, we made the dissection here. On the other side, uh, as uh, the medial half uh, of the pedicle is, is still uh, attached to the graft and is not detached here. Uh, so we absolutely keep this part and we harvest the graft with the scissors. So here you can see the harvesting of the graft. Uh, so uh, with the scissors there, and we absolutely keep the, the pedicle there. And so we we pay attention to, to not to destroy the, the pedicle and to keep it safe. And you can see here the shape of the graft, which is, which is uh, very big and uh, able to revascularize. Then if you want to be sure, but uh, we, you don't have to do it uh, uh, each time, but if you want to check and to be sure, you, you can release the tourniquet and uh, you will have to wait from a few minutes because the artery is really small, but you can see here the good bleeding of, uh, of the graft. Then, uh, we uh, protect the, the um, radial uh, artery and uh, the pedicle and uh, the, the graft and we retract it and then we can do the shortening of radius uh, osteotomy uh, here and uh, then we, uh, we do the fixation with a, a volar plate. 
then we open uh, the articular capsule just in front of the lunate and uh, we can empty the lunate with a curate. Uh, the advantage uh, to go through the palmar uh, approach is that uh, in this area there is no cartilage uh, at the opposite of the dorsal part, so it's uh, very safe to do it from the volar part and uh, there's no damage for the cartilage and we can empty the lunate uh, uh, by this uh, approach. So you can see here we open the, the capsule, then we will uh, be directly uh, in front of the lunate and uh, we can empty it right there. Then uh, we will uh, uh, put the graft uh, uh, into the lunate uh, uh, and you can see uh, that we put the pedicle, uh, we, we take care of the pedicle and we put the graft so, uh, in, uh, in the, the hole uh, we previously made. So here you can see uh, the graft and the graft uh, fit into the lunate just there. And then you can uh, move your your wrist to to check uh, the stability. Then you can uh, make a temporary uh, fixation, a uh, radiolinate or a uh, scaphoidinate with a uh, with a pin. Uh, and in some cases, when you have a good stability, you can even just uh, do some uh, stitches. So this is a, a series of sorry five patients uh, operated between uh, 1994 and 2010. There is a uh, 20 female and uh, 15 male. The mean age is uh, 30.3 years old, uh, range from uh, 17 to 63. There is a preoperative RMI in all the cases. And uh, as according to Lishman uh, classification, there are eight um, cases of uh, stage 2, 23 stage uh, 3A, and 4 stage uh, 3B. The patient had the pain in all the cases with permanent pain and uh, incapacitating in 21 cases. The active range of motion was uh, very small, 46 uh, degrees, and uh, uh, the strength was uh, the half of the opposite side. So this is uh, the case we showed you uh, with uh, uh, an empty uh, lunate, uh, uh, but the cartilage is uh, still good, but the lunate is uh, totally empty, and uh, you can see that we have a, a real collapse uh, on, the, on the imaging. So the patient had uh, the shortening uh, of uh, the radius and uh, uh, the graft, and after 22 years, you can see uh, that uh, we have a, a recovery of the vascularization of the lunate. The range of motion are not complete, but are very good and uh, useful. Uh, the average follow-up is uh, 153 months with a minimum of follow-up of 10 years. Uh, there is no pain in 27 cases and moderate pain in 8 cases. The range of motion increased uh, 61 degree. The strength is 75% uh, of the, the opposite side and the average period for return to work is 3.5 months. So uh, post-operative RMI in, in the older cases, we had the healing uh, in uh, 28 cases, all the stage 2 healed, um, the 19 stage 3A and 1 stage 3B. There was stabilization in six cases, uh, and in two of uh, those six cases, there were the, stabilization re uh, the stabilization remained in four cases, and uh, in, the, in two cases, one uh, moved to healing and one to failure. Um, and uh, there were so three uh, failure uh, in, in this uh, study uh, who required a secondary wrist arthrodesis and two uh, first row carpectomy. So the complication is stabilization, a complication uh, after five years of follow-up, we had an unchanged X-ray, so it was not worse and not better, unchanged RMI, but the patient had no pain. What will it give in the future? Uh, in two of the six cases, we had one healing and uh, one uh, uh, failure. So. Um, we, we still have to, but the, the most important is that the patient had uh, no pain in those, uh, in, in those uh, uh, cases. Um, late union of radius osteotomy in four cases, it was at the beginning, and as you can see here, the osteotomy was a little bit too proximal, and uh, uh, now uh, we moved for a more distal osteotomy, and uh, uh, there is no more problem for the, the radius osteotomy, and there was a one cell uh, dystrophy. So here in clinical case, you can see a complete uh, uh, necrosis of uh, uh, the lunate. Um, 
and the imaging, the patient had first a radial a radiososteotomy uh, alone, and uh, there was still remaining pain. So this was uh, at the beginning. Uh, and so he had uh, the, the graft secondary, secondarily, and uh, after 25 years, uh, he's uh, doing well with a good range of motion recovery of the strands. So in conclusion, the use of vascularized bone graft for revascularization of lunate and chemo disease associated to radius shortening osteotomy seems a safe and reliable procedure in stage 3A. For the stage 2, the issue of operating or not to the stage 2 is not fully resolved now, now but uh, all the case healed in uh, this theory, which is uh, uh, very uh, interesting, uh, and uh, uh, it's not always the case uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the cons uh, if we don't do anything. But whatever, we first uh, start with the conservative treatment. Uh, so if the pain remains, uh, we, we had uh, healing in those cases. And the graft uh, vascularized by palmar artery needs only one approach, uh, uh, which is uh, good, and it's a palmar approach, so without cartilage. A long follow-up confirms the outcomes uh, in our theory. And uh, in the stage 3B, atrocopic removal of lunate seems an interesting direction, but uh, Lorenzo will uh, speak about it. Thank you for your attention. Now we move to a small break for uh, questions. Yeah, perhaps uh, a couple of uh, questions from the chat. Uh, uh, one question for Simon first. Uh, uh, in two words, what could be uh, the implications of for, from your findings and treatment? May, may I add something, uh, Simon, before? Because the question is very interesting, I think. And uh, the question is, uh, until now, we take in into account only the bone problem and uh, the shortening uh, uh, of uh, radio the shortening radius osteotomy seems to be the less worse uh, technique and we had the revascularization of the bone but according to your fantastic work and congratulations once more time uh, do you think that we have to treat now or to to check the extrinsic ligament because step by step, uh, not only for the Kinbock disease, but also for the scaphoidinate, we, we see that the extrinsic ligament seems really essential. And uh, what, what do you think about that? Do you think you have to, to, to treat also the ligament? Thanks, Christoph, and thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, what we've noticed and is when we're scoping these patients, there's a lot of synovitis and there's a lot of involvement in the extrinsic ligaments. And I think um, what some of the 4D CT scan work has shown is that there is a large soft tissue element to Keenbox disease, um, which we're talking, a lot of people talk about revascularization um, and, and, and salvage procedures, but I think the soft tissue element is a significant one. Um, and I think if we are trying to preserve the lunate, we need to actually consider what is the state of the intrinsic and the extrinsic ligaments. Um, All right. So um, I might help answer that question. So uh, Christoph, I think that's a great question. Uh, I think what we've learned is uh, David Lickman has taught us about the bone. I've made some contributions on the articular surface and what Simon and uh, myself have been able to do is I think we've brought in the dynamic components. So Simon showed that beautiful example of the lunate punching in on the volar side. Uh, to be honest with you, we were surprised to see that too. And so, you know, maybe we can, with arthroscopy, debride that spot. The patients with ulnar styloid impingement, maybe we can arthroscopically debride that. So I think what we need to get better at is really understanding exactly where the pain is and what the problem is. It's not just avas necrosis, the lunate, and they're all the same. We should definitely not be treating every patient the same. We need to understand what the problem is, whether it's the bone, the cartilage or impinging. So now we've got a concept of impinging, which we never thought about before for Keenbox. We always thought about it for scaphalunate instability and snack and slack wrist, but now we're thinking about it for this. Or maybe any other questions, uh, Lorenzo? Do, you, do we have any other questions? Uh, we have a question maybe for Mathilde or, or, or uh, Christophe. Uh, after the first radial Mathilde, osteotomy, Mathilde. It is possible to perform uh, this uh, vascularized graft. So, uh, there are concerns about the osteosynthesis plate creating an injury of the artery. Mathilde or Christophe, please. 
I can answer because it's a really interesting question. You see, uh, the last case uh, we presented was a case operated, of course, at this period, the shortening osteotomy was performed a little more uh, proximally. So it means we, you probably you you don't touch to the distal vascularization. But in my practice, even when you touch this vascularization, the nature recreates the uh, the archery after a few uh, a, a few months so sometimes i reoperate some patient and i discover a new a completely new uh vascular uh, volar carpal artery so it's not uh, in fact it's not a problem but the question is if you choose this kind of uh, technique you have to add the boss procedure because mm -hmm. i have frequently see some patients with only the revascularization and uh, uh, it, it won't work uh, so greatly that uh, with uh, the association of uh, shortening osteotomy or uh, uh, opening uh, closed wedge osteotomy and uh, and the revascularization. I don't know why exactly, but uh, it's, a, it's a little experimental and empiric, but you know, now it's more than 20 years of follow-up and it, it seems to, to work. There is another uh, question uh, about this. Uh, uh, what about the short fredo lunate ligament? Does the volar approach uh, affect uh, this ligament? Yeah, very good question. Very good question. No, it is just the contrary. Because uh, the advantage of the volar uh, approach is to avoid uh, the lesion of cartilage if you pass uh, dorsally and to uh, damage the ligament because you can pass at the 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 volar cover of the the volar aspect of the lunate which is not covered by cartilage and you can let intact the the lunotricatural, volar lunotricatural and volar luno scaphoidinate ligament, and uh, like that you don't uh, create any instability. But the question now is uh, to think uh, as uh, Simon showed us, and uh, the extrinsic ligament uh, could be a problem. I have just a, a short personal question. What about the length of the pedicle? Have you ever had any trouble with the length of the pedicle? Yes, it's a good question. The length of pedicle is is largely sufficient. Uh, the 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 most important is to make a large decision, a large decision until the lateral aspect of the radius. It's very easy because if you uh, see the the radius is here, the radial artery is here. And in fact, it's not very close to the radius. So the volar carpal artery uh, uh, was born uh, from the artery and lies on the distal uh, volar aspect of the radius, but touch the bone only on the medial aspect. So when you are removed the artery, which is always in front of the uh, the, the uh, aponeurosis of the polatocaratus and up to the periosteum, so when you pass under the periosteum. After that, you can cut all the the, the muscular and the ligament attachment until the lateral aspect of the radius, and you have a very, very long pedicle sufficient to go until uh, the lunate. Thank you for the advice. I think we can move, Lorenzo, uh, for next lecture, maybe. Yeah, we're behind schedule, so we're gonna back to get back to Greg Bain. Greg, is everything okay for you? So we're gonna do an algorithm-based approach to Keenbox disease, um, and uh, so if we think about Keenbox disease, I think most people think about the um, the vascularity, but I think it's more about the microstructure of the bone, a stress fracture, the venous drainage, and the concept of compartment syndrome of bone, and a lot less about the artery. And this we refer to as the basic science model of Keenbox disease. If we look at the microstructure of the lunate, we can see that there's spanning trabeculae and that between the, the proximal and the distal subchondral bone plate, there are trabeculae that hold up the other subchondral bone plate. And obviously with collapse of these, this would lead to collapse of the lunate. With regard to the size and the shape of all of the different bones, the, we all know that uh, if you have a negative ulnar variance, that's a factor. If you have a type one lunate, and also if the lunate tends to hang over the side and is uncovered, these are all some of the factors that are associated with Keenbox disease. 
if we put this uh, lunate here, this microstructure of the lunate onto the uh, radius, this is where the fracture typically occurs. And interestingly, even in this dry bone, we can see there's a small stress fracture where the position of that fracture occurs. David Lickman, uh, many years ago, taught us about many of the osseous components of Keenbox disease. And uh, Simon's just presented to us some of the, the factors and uh, that we've been able to work on with regard to 4D CT scan. And this paper has just recently been published if you wish to look at that in the Journal of uh, Hand Surgery. The other interesting thing is here, if we look at the, the lunate, we can see that there's actually movement between the proximal and subchondral bone plates. And we can see the width of the lunate is wider and this leads to instability. Interestingly, we can see a dark spot here, which is um, like a vacuum. So there's obviously some suction effect within the carpus and we've seen that also with scopolunar instability. This is a, a lunate that we removed in the clinical practice and uh, we can see here there's this fissuring and fibrous tissue. There's obviously a fracture through here. There's reabsorption of the bone in the subchondral bone plate and cysts. But I think what's most interesting is that there's healing. This uh, bone on the vole and dorsal aspects, this is new bone. So the lunate, despite the fact it's ischemic and has areas of fibrosis, it has a potential to heal. And this is important, particularly in the younger patient. So revascularization particularly in the patients less than 20. So what about the articular surface? So this is a lunate we've removed and we can see the ulceration. Uh, again, we can see this at arthroscopy with all these little calcific deposits. And if we go here, we can see that the articular surface uh, remains principally intact, uh, but the subchondral bone plate is completely gone. If we look at the uh, lunate facet, and this is an arthroscopy, we can see that the, uh, the lunate has this uh, sclerosis. We look at this uh, lunate facet, we can see the sclerosis and exposed bone, and we would refer to this as a non-functioning articular surface. In the same wrist as we go across to the scaphoid facet, we can see a smooth, glistening functional surface. And these findings at arthroscopy, we, we found to be very useful to defining type of problem that we have in the in the wrist. We developed this classification some years ago and it goes from that uh, in the central column that all aspects around the lunate are intact through to having two articular surfaces here with a lunate fracture and then all four articular surfaces adjacent to the lunate are involved. And we found this very useful to help understand the pathology but also to proceed from there and go on to um, to defining treatment options. So this was the articular aspects of this and I'd like to acknowledge Simon who's helped put this together and he's, we've looked at the long-term outcome of our results and that's a very interesting uh, paper with regard to the value of arthroscopy in the longer term. So the classifications, uh, we have the osseous classification, the vascular classification by Schmidt and our articular cartilage one and this is how you might see the lunate and how you might classify the lunate and Keenbox. But this is what David Lickman and I did to try and interpret and understand what's happening in the lunate in our patients. And then more importantly, understand how that all fits together as a concept of how the wrist works and not just one aspect of it. So this is to consider the lunate and the whole wrist in uh, this uh, algorithm that we've developed. So this algorithm goes from A, which is for age, because we know the age is important, B, the bone, and C is the carpus. So what, what can we do as the surgeon, which is D? So these green things here, arthroscopy, osteotomies, these are the sort of procedures that I think every orthopedic surgeon can do. But some of the more advanced things, arthroscopic limited wrist fusions, fixing the necrotic lunate, free tissue transfer, these are more difficult things and I really think that they should remain in specialist units and also the lunate pyrocarbon arthroplasty. We found that very difficult to stabilize. So we have this concept of the red, yellow and green lights. So the young patient, like Perthes disease, does very well and usually does not need surgical treatment. However, those patients who fail may get some benefit from epiphysodesis or an unloading procedure with an STT joint pinning. We go on to B, which is the bone, and we look at whether the lunate's intact or whether it's compromised or whether it's really not reconstructable. So if the lunate's intact, well, we really want to protect it. So it might be that we're doing a radial shortening 
or it might be that if the lunate in if the ulnar variance is similar that we might do a capitate shortening or an stt joint pinning or even a radial osteotomy with a wedge shape so these are the fundamental concepts so going on to the uh, radial shortening we've modified how we do this we make an incision just on the radial side we put a cannulated drill in we use uh, like a small reamer or a small os uh, oscillating saw to cut the radius and then we stabilize it with a screw and it only needs a small splint so we no longer use plates when doing radial shortening osteotomy and the reason for this is the uh, periosteum is adequate there and we just need to stabilize it with a single screw we do not need to go ahead and do complex things for those of you who are interested in greens online that's described in detail we're actually doing more capitate shortening osteotomies and this is similar to how we might do uh, a distal screw and a scaphoid we take out a little bit of the third metacarpal for access we put a k wire and a drill in we then remove that we do our oscillating saw or a small reamer at this level and the this position of this should be more distal than we would uh, previously have thought and this is to protect uh, these neurovascular or the vascular structures which is actually similar again to the scaphoid with retrograde flow into the capitate we then put a cannulated screw into the uh, capitate and shorten it up so it's actually all an extra articular procedure it's a small uh, incision over the top of the, the capitate so we would do this in a patient as an intact lunate and we've had no non-unions and no avascular necrosis. We think this is a good technique. We're certainly doing more of these. When the lunate becomes compromised, it starts to get a bit more difficult. And then there's many dis techniques described uh, in the literature. So at arthroscopy, we would often see what we'd refer to as a floating lunate with the traction. It means that the floating defect above it uh, enables us to, to be in a, a situation where we can put bone graft into there. And we think a multimodal approach may be required and there's many types of bone grafting. The Hori is the simplest one. Uh, we've just heard in detail about Christoph's technique. But the idea of this multimodal approach is not new. We do multimodal approach for rheumatoid arthritis and for cancer now. If we go on to trying to fix the lunate, this is a much more difficult scenario and I think we need to have large fragments that needs to be vascularized uh, fragments. I'd like to thank Mark Barrett for this video, which showed a technique where he's used this. I think this is a difficult procedure to perform in clinical practice. Christoph's told us also about resection of the clavicle. I think we're going to have another whole talk on that. So once the, the whole, this, the lunate is uh, fragmented, we start to get secondary changes in the carpus, such as instability of the carpus and then degenerative changes. And in these scenarios, we're starting to look at proximal row carpectomy and scaphocapitate fusions. Uh, the role of arthroscopic limited wrist fusions, I don't have a lot of experience, but Eva Bauer and PC Ho, I think, have done a lot of work in this area. So in, in summary, the etiological factors, I think, are important and underpin the basic science model of Keenbox disease. And the Lickman-Bain uh, algorithm, basically, if they're young, go without surgery, and also that those above 70, if the lunate is intact, look at an unloading procedure. And if once the carpus gets more involved, then a motion preserving procedure such as a proximal row carpectomy or a scaphoid capitate fusion. Thank you for having me involved in your uh, symposium. Thank you very much, Greg. Very nice uh, overview of the algorithm. Um, let's move on to the lecture by Jo Yu Pli from Korea is not here with us, but we have a, a video of his uh, lecture. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My topic is vascularized piece from transfer for advanced KMBAX disease. My name is Jo Lee from Department of Orthopedic Surgery, the Catholic University of Korea. According to the Leitman staging system, Advanced cambic disease can be defined as a, a stage 3B and stage 4, which has a scaphoid rotation, lunate fracture, or uh, arthritis around the lunate. For treatment of advanced Cambex disease, limited intercarpal fusion or proximal row carpectomy are generally recommended. However, several possible complications can happen after limited intercarpal fusion, such as radio scaphoid arthritis or unaddressed location of the corpus. 
in this particular case, scaphoid came closer to the capitate without changing uh, the position of the capitate, which creates uh, the wide gap between uh, radial styloid and the scaphoid in this radiograph. Symptoms with advanced Kahneman disease are uh, usually located uh, in the volar side due to the larger volar lunate fragments. And uh, carpal tunnel syndrome and flexor tendon synopsis are commonly uh, occurred in these patients. You can see large volar lunate fragment compress the flexor tendons and uh, causes carpal tunnel syndrome in this patient. And it was confirmed during the operative procedures. In 1971, Beck and Safar first described the vascularized pisiform transfer by using dosal branch of an artery as a pedicle. I started using this procedure for my patients uh, after uh, opening up the carpal tunnel. Carpal tunnel I found the uh, calcification and fragmented lunate, which was removed. Then, then uh, vascular pisiform was harvested and put it into the space and fixed with 2K wires. So far, I've done five cases of vascular pisiform transfer for advanced Kahneman disease. Average age of the patients were 55 years old. Average range of motion of the wrist was about 50 degrees in each direction, and the grip strength was about 80% of the affected side. This 62-year-old male patient had a fragmented lunate with arthritis on the latin lunate joint. Vascularized pisiform was placed on the lunate fossa, and it was fixed with two K wires coming from scaphoid and triquetrum. And these two K wires were uh, placed up to six weeks after surgery. In this final follow-up radiographs, kappa height and uh, vascularized pisiform is maintained. This 77-year-old male patient had advanced Kahneman disease with uh, fragmented lunate. After removal of the lunate fragments. Vascularized pisiform was placed and it was fixed with two K wires. This final follow of radiographs shows well maintained kappa alignment and uh, there is no collapse of the transferred pisiform as well. There must be some concerns on vascularized pisiform transfer, especially this procedure. Uh, cuts the scaphalunate and lunotricator uh, ligaments. But I think the fragmented lunate is uh, never be a normal function. And uh, as long as this, those are intercarpal ligament is intact, pisiform can act as a spacer during the radial on motion. It would be the same as lunate implant osteoplasty, which was uh, reported as successful in recent literature. Another concern would be the size mismatch. Although volume of the physipom is less than the volume of the lunate, but that the heights of these two bones are comparable. And the cartilage of the physipom has to be go towards to the capitate to restore the metacarpal joint. I found several advantages of vascularized physipom transfer. Carpal tunnel syndrome, and the flexor tenosynovitis, which is frequently accompanied with the advanced Kahneman disease, can be addressed simultaneously. Range of motion of the wrist joint is greatly preserved after pisiform transfer, and limited intercarpal fusion or proximal row capectomy still can be an option if pisiform transfer has failed. Thanks for your attention. All right, thank you. And so we're going to move to the last uh, topic. I will uh, give you a few details on the arthroscopic resection of the um, of the lunate. It's going to be a, a short um, topic because, of course, we don't have a lot of uh, data on uh, on what it could be an interesting option. 
So we know that the open uh, isolated lunate exclusion is, uh, was uh, a great part of the treatment of the Kinbuck disease for a long time. Now it's uh, considered as a controversial treatment, not uh, often uh, chosen by, um, uh, by the surgeons today. Uh, but there are some authors that keep uh, reporting some satisfactory uh, results. And the, the second thing that we know is that the arthroscopy, the wrist arthroscopy, uh, has uh, brought something very important in the treatment of uh, the Kinbox disease, as it was described by uh, uh, Greg and Simon just previously. So we know that um, maybe combining both could be an idea. And we know also that the arthroscopic um, technique has transformed several techniques that were uh, currently performed in an open fashion um, until recently. And uh, that uh, doing, doing it arthroscopically changed the prognosis, uh, such as uh, the arthroscopic bone graft for scaphoid nonunion, uh, or for lunate um, intraosseous ganglion for the surgery of uh, capsulo, capsulo ligamentous repairs in the, in the wrist for even uh, carpal fusion and proximal row carpectomy. So maybe the isolated lunate resection for the Kinbuck could be uh, an option under arthroscopy. There have been few works on this, but we have a, um, a communication from the French Society uh, meeting in 2015 by uh, Jean-Michel Cognier and Pascal Louis that report uh, a patient with a 3B stage of the Kinbox disease uh, that have um, been operated with the arthroscopic lunate excision with uh, satisfactory results uh, both on pain and strength and also on range of motion and uh, more importantly with a radiological stability of the lesions um, in, in time with no complication and that's with a three year uh, follow-up. There have been a few studies on um, biomechanical uh, aspects of uh, comparing between uh, arthroscopic and open resection of the of the lunate and it seems that uh, resecting the lunate and the arthroscopy uh, prevents kinematic changes uh, of the proximal row uh, of course by maintaining the uh, integrity of the different uh, corporal ligaments. So we have a small experience to share. We have uh, six patients that were operated by, uh, uh, mostly by Christophe uh, in our center uh, with a mean age of 37, four female and two male people. And uh, mostly was uh, 3B and 4 uh, stage of the, of the Lisman classification. And they were all operated in the arthroscopy with full resection of the lunate. It's a quite simple technique you use uh, the, the usual uh, radiocarpal and midcarpal uh, portal to be sure to have a complete resection at the end. And of course, you do not harm any uh, ligamentous structure. So uh, we obtain good aspect on um, functional results. You can see this, uh, this range of motion post-operative within the full year, one year post-operative. You see good flexion ex extension also. The idea is uh, in our center, we did a few studies on the functional results. We did uh, see that we had an improvement, a significant improvement on the pain and uh, grip strength and range of motion, only by removing the lunate uh, under arthroscopy without doing anything else. So probably it's an interesting option for the late stages as a salvage procedure. It's uh, quite simple to, to perform, it's reliable. Uh, by preserving all the capsular and the ligamentous attachments, probably the key of the, of the procedure. And probably it could be uh, something that will uh, uh, do, make it choose less and less indication for uh, partial fusion and other salvage, uh, salvage procedure. Uh, so it's something I think we all need to work on this uh, within the, the few next years. Thank you very much. I think maybe we'll move on to the last uh, discussion, Alam. Yes, we have a couple uh, of questions, but so we are we are uh, short of time. Um, uh, we have some concerns about the uh, PZ form uh, transferred, about uh, 
about the stability of the implants, uh, our colleague is not on stage with you today, but uh, what you can say is in the SAFAR procedure uh, in the first place, uh, it, uh, this procedure was not uh, indicated in the stages uh, um, up to uh, 3B. Questions remain about uh, the uh, PZ form transfer. I have a question for Professor Bain. Uh, what about uh, in the assessment, uh, in the arthroscopic assessment, what about the false negative? Do you have some uh, cases that are arthroscopic grade zero with subchondral uh, collapse? That's uh, one of the concerns about the uh, arthroscopic assessment. So now that's a good question. In the initial classification, uh, I even went, went back and looked at what we did back in 2006. So if there's a false floor, we actually define that as being a non-functional articular surface. So you can have articular cartilage, but then a, a false uh, floor of that cartilage. So we actually went straight to doing more, um, cell, not cell, doing reconstructive procedures in that case. The other case where you can have a, a false uh, negative is if you've got um, a small fracture in the subchondral bone plate, you can, can you can palpate it, but you can't quite see it. So we called this a concealed fracture. So the fracture would be there. And in fact, when we looked at our long-term results, we had two cases where we just did an arthroscopic debridement, where we think there were concealed fractures. And then later on, the patient had further collapse and ultimately ended up needing a proximal row carpectomy. So I think that we're able to get past those things. Um, uh, so that those are the two examples that I think are important. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, there is another question for Greg or Simon. Uh, what about uh, the uh, gener regenerative techniques special and uh, the bone marrow uh, implanted cells in the early stages? Could you share your opinion about this, please? Yeah, um, so I've, I've looked at that. And so I, what we're trying to do is for the, those patients who have some fragmentation there are some cases where we're putting a pin from the scaphoid to the capitate and then we're looking at uh, using morselized bone graft but there are papers described where they're using like more of an aspirate of uh, stem cells and bone marrow aspirates uh, so i think that to use this um the aspirate of bone marrow versus bone graft i don't think that makes a lot of difference but i think there's a place for that and uh, there is uh, just one yeah. more question about the unloading procedures uh, could you share your opinion about the great the greater treatment option on the procedures procedures you uh, you would choose there is there are a question about the, the unloading procedures what would you choose what are the most efficient yeah, procedures? So the, the things that we so the things right. that we're doing more of we're doing a lot more of capitate shortening so in the past, I thought we shouldn't do it, but this, this single cut, single screw capitate shortening is a procedure that takes about half an hour and it unloads only the lunate. So I, I think there's, that's a good thing. The single cut radial osteotomy, I think is a lot better. So if you had a 25 year old girl and you make a cut this big on her wrist versus making a cut this big, I think that we should be doing these more minimally invasive single cut osteotomies. And one of the things that's interesting about the farage of the radius, um, the some of the results that are coming out of uh, South America are actually quite positive. So the idea of just putting a drill hole in here and just scooping it out just doesn't feel right to me. But if I do the osteotomy and I shorten it and I unload the lunate, plus I'm doing some of the farage of the radius at the same time, I think that does make some sense. Um, so we're trying to go to more minimally invasive, so arthroscopic debridements. And I think the challenge for us now is with what Simon's just presented for us, uh, to try and link in those dynamic findings so that we understand the dynamic findings and then identify the procedure. So that very, that rotated lunate facet there, the rotated bit of lunate, it may be that we can just arthroscopically debride that or arthroscopically debride the ulnar styloid. I think this is where the new form of surgery will go. Are there any more questions coming yeah, through? There are many questions. I have one about uh, partial capitate shortening. Uh, it seems to, uh, to give uh, good results, uh, whatever the ulnar variance. What do you think about this? It's a very seducing procedure. So the so with regard to capitate shortening, I think you, you can do it regardless of whether there's uh, positive or negative ulnar variance. And I, th I think you actually said partial capitate shortening, which is developed by Moritomo. 
I yes. haven't done that because it's a little bit fiddly, um, and I, the, you know, the capitate, and I just it basically creating a double plane, a double yes. plane osteotomy of the capitate, and I think that's a bit more difficult. Um, I have spoken to him, and he's happy with that procedure. And I think he's a very good doctor, so I th I'm sure it works well in his hands, but I've tended to just do the simple capitate osteotomy. It's quite difficult, technically. Uh, thank you. Uh, we had uh, one, uh, just one more question. Uh, it's a, a very short clinical case for uh, Greg or Simon, please. There's a case about uh, a case about an active uh, 25 years uh, woman, and uh, she's. Um, uh, right with a uh, right uh, stage uh, three C uh, Kimbok in such ad advanced disease and uh, uh, young age uh, is a lunate salvage procedure an option uh, with high uh, physical demand? What do you, what would you recommend in this case, please? Do you want us to check the X-rays? Uh, uh, we don't have the no? X-rays. Twenty years old woman okay. with a three, a stage three C. Okay. Okay. Maybe they don't have. Go on, Simon. It's difficult to see to make a comment um, without the imaging there, but presumably then there's a decent sized coronal fracture there. Um, I, I would want to know a bit more about the um, the lunate, the fragmentation of the lunate, and how many pieces it's in, um, in terms of whether to preserve that or not, um, whether it's just a clear single coronal fracture, or whether there's several elements to it. Um, but I'd also want to know about a little bit more than that, and I'd want to see if there was any carpal translocation, um, which we're seeing in some of these um, advanced stages of Keenbox disease. So I think it's quite difficult to say without commenting on the imaging. Because I, I think some of our colleagues uh, uh, do not practice arthroscopy, and uh, the question, the, the the concerns are about uh, what would be uh, your uh, favorite uh, therapeutic option uh, in the case if uh, in uh, 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 you don't practice arthroscopy in such cases with Lakeland three C, for example. Can I comment on that? Um, so yeah. when we developed okay. this uh, classification in two thousand and six, um, I found that I would go to the EWAS meeting. And everybody loved what we were talking about. And then I would go to a hand meeting and no one cared. And the problem was that everyone who was saw my classification saw it had to be arthroscopy. So in 2011, we changed it to be an articular-based concept. And the concept there was to change it that it doesn't have to be arthroscopy, but it basically to start respecting the articular cartilage because that's actually more important than the arthroscopy. So what we found was that we started looking at the MRIs more, we started looking at the CTs, and if you've got a, a, a big displaced fracture of the lunate seeing on your CT, well then you know the articular cartilage can't be good because it's all completely fractured. So we changed it to, from an arthroscopy to be an articular based approach for exactly that reason. And we thought it was important that your members of the French Hand Society understood about the, uh, the fragmentation. And the other part was that a lot of people were doing vascularized bone grafts and they were putting the vascularized bone graft in and the lunate was very fragmented and shattered. So that we thought that was bad. So back to your question on the 25 year old patient, we would be trying to do something to maintain that the young lady's um, carpus and maintain the height of the carpus. But if it's very fragmented, then unfortunately, I think you need to be looking at doing an, some form of a salvage procedure, whether that be Christoph's arthroscopic excision or whether you do a proximal row carpectomy or a scapha capitate fusion. What's interesting is that for a long time, I was very concerned about doing a PRC in a younger patient, and we would not do it in younger than anyone younger than 40. But we've followed our results up, and I'd like to acknowledge Simon because he's gone through them in detail. But the patients who are younger than 40 with Keenbox, even out to more than 10 years, they're still doing well. So it's not we try and avoid it in the young patient, but we still think we can do it if we have to. Thank you, Professor uh, Bain. I, I like think we're short. Uh... Yeah, Simon. Simon. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to, um, with your comment about PRC, um, a number of these patients will develop arthritis between the radius and the capitate, but we've found that not a lot of these patients are symptomatic. So even though they have arthritis there at 10 years or 20 years, 
functionally um, they do well, but um, probably in a younger patient, I'd prefer a scape capitate fusion just to maintain the carbal height. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we have to. Thank you. We have to stop because we are out of time. So many thanks to everyone, to our guest speakers from around the globe. Um, and thanks to our viewers also. And in the meantime, be sure to register for the next uh, monthly webinar of the Institut de la Main uh, that will take place on May 24th about the stiffness after elbow arthroplasty. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. You Thank, you. Thank, Thank, you. Well Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Great session. Thank you. Bye. Wonderful work. Bye.